Welcome everyone to this our um, AIIA University of Tasmania webinar on tomorrow's strategic engagement with Asia by Professor Nicholas Farrelly from the School of Social Sciences at the University of Tasmania. Um, I'm Kim Boyer, I'm the Chair of the Australian Institute of International Affairs in um, Tasmania and it's a great pleasure that we welcome you to this webinar tonight. We've um, in, in, in welcoming you, I want to pay respects from both the universities and the AIIA's perspective to the traditional owners of the land on which we are meeting both, both physically and virtually, um, the Mulwinder people and the Palawa people, and to pay respect to their elders, past, present and emerging. Um, this event tonight is part of the university's um, Island of Ideas um, program, which is part of um, the virtual events being managed during the COVID-19 crisis, of which the AIIA in Tasmania is a very um, keen and, uh, and eager participant and partner. And we appreciate the university's um, joint approach with us in AIIA events, both in virtual time and in real time. Um, Nicholas Farrelly is a newcomer to Tasmania, but certainly no newcomer to international affairs. Um, Nicholas was appointed at the beginning of this year as Head of Social Sciences at the University of Tasmania, and he comes from a very strong academic background in, in particularly relating to Asia, but also to Myanmar from ANU. He's been a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford. He's um, a great addition to the University of Tasmania and it's terrific to have him. Um, we look forward um, very much, Nicholas, to your discussion on the strategic engagement with Asia, COVID-19, but also the other growing political and economic pressures in the Asian region have uh, given us much pause for thought and what tomorrow is going to look like is, uh, is really significant in this time of quite uh, unprecedented change in both political and economic terms. So welcome, Nicholas. Um, oh, gosh, I've got a couple of housekeeping things. Sorry about that. Firstly, I need to say um, that there's a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, please uh, enter your questions on that during Nicholas's talk, and we'll try and get through as many as possible after Nicholas has spoken. Um, and and basically um, to say that, oh gosh, um, your mic and camera have been disabled by the, um, by the people who run the system because we don't want interruptions to happen and to spoil it for other people. And basically um, the idea of this program is, is really important in terms of pe keeping people connected and we're really excited that this is attracting people from not only Tasmania, but also across Australia and some international guests. Um, and please um, don't forget to do the Q&A if you want to. Now, Nicholas, over to you. Great, thanks very much, Kim. Uh, it's a real pleasure for me to have this opportunity this evening to address you all on the topic of tomorrow's strategic engagement with Asia. I'm really grateful to the AIIA Tasmania team, uh, particularly Kim uh, and Ian for all of their support of this lecture, and also uh, to David, Belinda, and others at the University of Tasmania for everything that they've done uh, to pull together the Island of Ideas activity. I think as we all appreciate, uh, these are really challenging times, uh, particularly for those of us um, who have committed ourselves professionally and personally um, to uh, the good management of the challenging issues facing the world. And I hope that in my discussion here, I'm able, able to provide you with some insights on what I see um, as the, the particular responses that we might want to bear in mind. Um, you will note that I have um, across this presentation determined to add in some speculative notes. Um, and I'll, I'll say something more about how it is that we should be engaging as strategic analysts, uh, as commentators on international affairs, and as citizens of this uh, wide and diverse earth um, with um, the sorts of uh, futures and possibilities that confront us right now. <clears throat> 
I'd like to begin, though, right here in Hobart. Um, and I begin, in fact, on the 9th of January this year, uh, when, as the newly arrived head of social sciences at the University of Tasmania, I was out um, uh, early in the morning, about 6.30 in the morning, uh, pushing my young children in the pram along uh, the Derwent River. And for those of you who know Hobart well, you'll appreciate that a, a summer morning in this part of the world is simply spectacular. Um, I couldn't help but know Noticed that morning that a very large ship was making its way uh, down through the harbour towards um, the, the main um, terminal uh, where of course large cruise ships nowadays arrive on a regular basis uh, throughout the summer sailing season. Um, this cruise ship I had no idea at the time was in fact the Ruby Princess. Um, now famous, uh, so tragically, um, uh, for the health crisis that unfolded um, amongst uh, its passengers and crew. Um, and to imagine that on that peaceful, wonderful, splendid morning early in my time here in Tasmania, uh, it was this ship that was quietly making its way through the dawn light is I think a reminder um, that we don't know what's going to happen next, that we do need to engage with tomorrow in prudent and sensible and yes, even strategic ways, um, because there are challenges, some of which are relatively easy to anticipate. Others, of course, are really, really hard. Some of the hard issues for Australia and Australians, to my mind, are captured in a distortion of the world map, such as the one on the screen right now. This is a map that I've used many times over the past decade. It happens to be one of my favorites. It's a map where, as you can all appreciate, Australia has um, fallen away in the bottom corner. Uh, a small collection of yellow squares, 25 million or so people dwarfed by the behemoths of Indonesia, Bangladesh, India. Vietnam, the Philippines, Japan, and yes, of course, China. Uh, the countries to Australia's north are, are so incredible, so extreme often in terms of their population densities, their concentrations of humanity, um, that the relative scale as presented on a map such as this um, reminds us all that Australia on the world stage, even on the Asian stage, um, has some modest capabilities at its disposal. But let's not push this kind of presentation of population too far because we all appreciate that there are other ways that we could distort a map of the globe uh, by, by military power, by economic muscle, uh, perhaps by uh, creative spirit and impulse. Uh, perhaps we could also um, distort the world in terms of effectiveness when it comes to something like pandemic response. We all appreciate that population isn't everything, and yet it is something, uh, particularly for Australia, uh, particularly for a country that has a continent all to itself. The other maps that are so key to everything that we need to consider right now looks something like this. And this is one that I pulled recently from the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade's own Smart Traveller website. And this is in every respect an astonishing presentation of the world, a world in which Australians are actively discouraged, indeed in, in most cases banned from travelling. This isn't a country, a uh, uh, a presentation of the globe that many of us perhaps had expected to, to ever see. And yet here we are in late May 2020, considering how it is that we take this world uh, and turn it into something better, something with more connections and, and into a world where Australia can continue to prosper and to be secure. So in my lecture tonight, I'm going to seek to work through four questions. Um, I want to say something quickly about the analytical context for this discussion of tomorrow's strategic engagement. There are some big questions and um, I, I want to give you at least my initial impressions of how we might handle them. Uh, then, of course, 
there are the questions of change. And I'll have something to say in the third section of this lecture um, about how it is that the strategic engagements that we have in mind are likely to shift over the months and years to come. And then I'll round this out with my brief thoughts on the implications with a particular emphasis on what this all means for Tasmania and Tasmanians. While I'm just getting warmed up though, it is worth emphasizing that as many pundits right now are reminding us, we do not know what will happen next. Um, and it's important that we acknowledge this uh, and that we are humble about our assertions of what it is that we may all face. And this is particularly important uh, given that so much of what is currently swirling around the world um, is really difficult. Um, there are so many different troubling and traumatic situations, uh, many of which have a long way to run, uh, that we need to be really cautious in our assessments and in our prognosis. Um, with, with that hesitation in mind though, I, I am reminded of a piece of, of scholarly work that I did with my great colleagues, Andrew Walker and Craig Reynolds a decade ago, where we sought to understand different ways of, of managing knowledge about the future, particularly in a Thai cultural context. And so we went to the trouble of, of reading scores of Thai handbooks about different kinds of agricultural and environmental knowledge. And, and what we found, and I think this quote from the conclusion sums it up, is, is that this kind of knowledge does in its own way shape how the future unfolds. And so when we are making assessments of the type that I'll be making here this evening, I hope that we do bear in mind that we are part of a really human process, sometimes individualistic and fatalistic, yes, but, but also a process where personal and collective agency is hugely important to driving the kinds of answers and outcomes that we might get. We are, I think I can say with no doubt, all really curious about what is going to happen next. So with that in mind, what's the analytical context here? And I'd like to just remind us all of the recent white papers produced across the Australian bureaucracy dealing with some of the key themes at the heart of this evening's lecture. Um, we all appreciate um, that it was the, the Gillard and Rudd governments that focused their attention on the Australia in the Asian Century white paper um, that was released back in 2012. More recently, there was the 2016 Defence white paper and then, of course, most recent of all, the 2017 Foreign Policy White Paper. Um, these documents need to be read by all of us who are seeking to understand what might happen beyond the pandemic period. Um, I think it's fair to say that they are providing a foundation for um, the consensus positions with which we all need to engage. And if you look closely at the priorities outlined in the 2017 Foreign Policy White Paper, um, you see a, a, a set of ideas um, distilled neatly um, and a response to conditions as they were judged at that time. And of course, we, we will all seek to debate these different objectives and the, the principles and, and values um, that underpin them. Um, and as you, as you can see here, I've noted the really important work of the Lowy Institute in helping to drive public discussion um, of the White Paper's foundations. And, and yet we should also acknowledge um, that uh, this is a process that we can all contribute to in different ways at different times, helping to ensure that Australia's public engagement um, with the challenges of Asian engagement are as healthy and as democratic as possible. There is a question, of course, about what happens to those priorities in the wake of the current pandemic. Um, when I checked, uh, 
it's true to say that uh, pandemic does get a couple of brief mentions in the 2017 foreign policy white paper. Um, but these are mentions that are almost afterthoughts. And there, there are now obviously going to be big questions about how Australia's foreign policy posture adjusts to everything that we've learned over recent months and what's that, what that is going to mean uh, for the ordering of priorities. Um, the a capacity for Australia to reduce the potential for pandemic catastrophe is perhaps, as we are learning, also somewhat limited um, because this is one of those areas um, where grand scale global level cooperation um, appears to be one of the, the only major weapons at everyone's disposal if we're seeking to keep uh, the international system up and running uh, in a relatively coherent way. Uh, we also find, of course, that the alternative to that uh, is to bunker down, is to stay local, um, is to rely on a fortress of protections that can be put in place, at least by the strongest political systems, uh, to ensure that their people stay safe against whatever else uh, might be out there in the wider world. The analysis of threats, therefore, is going to be a big part of this changing analytical terrain. And, and I note that it was the 2017 Independent Intelligence Review by Lestrange and Merchant um, that set out in very neat terms uh, some of the, the really difficult issues facing intelligence analysts in, it, in this country, but no doubt all around the world. Um, and as I say here, I'm concerned that we need to consider how it is that other types of threats get the right level of attention going forward. Um, what elements among the many non-traditional threats are going to require our, our serious consideration over the years to come? We have a an amazing basis on which we can engage with these questions because of the work that has been done. And I'm, I'm just uh, putting up here a, a number of recent titles that have sought to explain uh, the future of Australia-Asia relations in all of the complexity, the uncertainty and the ambiguity that we face. I'd suggest that informed public discussion of this type is one of the reasons why Australia has proved such a successful society over the long term. And we need to understand that advantage um, and appreciate what it may offer us in the future as well. Which is where we're ultimately going. And we have to ask ourselves, what next? And what might we do to adjust our models and mindsets uh, for the future? of Asian engagement and partnership facing Australia. Um, I have, with, with that question in mind, sought here, and I'll, I'll come back to a modified version of this scheme later in the lecture, but I have sought here to explain how it is that we might get to where we were, and, and let's just for tonight's purposes call that 2019, um, a period where there was much that was settled in the debates about how the world works. Yes, of course, um, there was push and shove analytically and in other respects um, because many lively debates continued through the, the decade that we've just seen. And yet um, so much has changed now so quickly. And I would suggest that some of what we now need to be working through when it comes to our models and the mindsets that support them um, will be understood in terms of firstly, pandemic performance, secondly, perceptions of that performance, and then thirdly, uh, our ambitions around the unknown futures that we're now um, walking into. Pandemic performance, we hear about it constantly, almost non-stop if we're inclined. Um, but it will be this, the settled state through 2021 and 2022, uh, which is, to my mind, going to determine um, how different countries are situated for their plans, whatever they may be. With that, though, there will be a, a whole other layer when it comes to perceptions of performance. Um, and I think those of us who are in Australia are fortunate that our country right now um, has proved as best we understand the, 
the health situation uh, to have done reasonably well, um, particularly when contrasted with, with some other countries around the world. Um, the economic outcomes, though, are, are much less clear. Um, and so we do need to appreciate that, that much analytical work will need to be done um, to appreciate pandemic performance and then hopefully to shape perceptions among expert and analytical communities, but also among the broader public when it comes uh, to what it is that we've all lived through and what that means for the unknown futures ahead. So with that analytical terrain in mind, how do we handle the big questions? And for those of you who don't have the, the pleasure of living here in Tasmania, I, I thought I'd just intersperse a few other pictures of our local landscapes um, to give us all a sense that we are part of a big and interconnected system. It's environmental, it's cultural, it's historical, it's geographical. Um, those connections are going to be just crucial to all of our engagement with the big questions. And here are four. These are my questions. These are the questions that are preoccupying me, that I'm seeking to appreciate. And if I'm completely honest with you all, I'm yet to come to a solid set of responses let alone proper answers when it comes to these questions. And so what I thought I would do for this evening's purposes is focus my attention on the fourth question. What might Australia do to positively influence the direction of change? And I have three ideas here. The first is about front-footed, proactive, creative diplomacy. Second is about trade and investment. Um, Australia's wealth, indeed Australia's security, is based on our success as a trading nation. And I think that's apparent to people in all corners of Australia, but it's particularly apparent here in Tasmania, uh, where so much of the state's recent success has relied on healthy global entanglements. And then of course, there are the, there are the big debates where Australia perhaps, at least to my mind, needs to be stepping up. What, what might those big debates mean? Well, here's just a short list. Um, the environment, sustainable development, and indeed foreign policy itself are all ripe for the right kind of Australian voices. And let's not presume that one voice is sufficient or that we need to be working towards a level of Australian agreement. Um, as I said earlier, one of our advantages is the vitality of our public spheres and the contributions that are made in so many different directions. And if you look at this list of topics, I think you'll agree that Australia has something to say, something that's not just useful for us, but that's important all across Asia and indeed uh, may have value to audiences in other parts of the world. So getting those big questions dealt with in the right way and then perhaps deciding on a few things to do well is going to be a challenge for the post-pandemic years. Um, I think that Australia needs to be careful about the kinds of contributions that it seeks to make. Um, we do need to bear in mind that first map that, that I began this evening's lecture with, a map that shows that Australia, at least by population, is much smaller than many of our neighbours. So, with, with that in mind, what and how will strategic engagement with Asia change? So earlier I showed a, a model which was much more general um, about the starting points, the pandemic performance, perceptions of pandemic performance, and then the futures unknown. Here in this model, it's a more specific uh, set of points that we need to bear in mind, leading ideally to some specific awareness about how it is that Asian engagement from an Australian perspective can grow over time. Uh, and as you work your way through this scheme, I hope you see that, yes, we can start with 2019, and then we have to be prepared to change our perspectives. We need to be thinking through how it is uh, that different systems, different societies, different leaders, different communities at local, regional, national, and then 
global scales have sought to handle all of the challenges that 2020 has presented. So how we do this in a thoughtful way, in a diplomatic way, in a way that's likely to lead to long-term success um, is, is going to be difficult. There's, there's no question uh, that these are tougher sorts of engagements than many of us have had to deal with in the past. So therefore, thinking it through um, quietly at first, but then publicly where possible is, is going to be crucial. Uh, for all of uh, the developments that we seek to engage with over the years to come. And when I break this down and look here at three of Australia's more important Asian partners, um, we, we get different um, dimensions uh, that start to flow from the model. And let me just highlight those in bold here. Um, so when it comes to Indonesia on pandemic performance, like certainly it is too early to say what state Indonesia is going to be in the aftermath of this new coronavirus, but there are some quite concerning trends that has implications for Australia. I don't need to remind this audience of how important uh, this particular partnership is, both for Jakarta and for Canberra. Um, and so we, we need to be considering how Australia might help to ensure that Indonesia's pandemic performance sets up the long-term engagement and the partnership that goes with it for uh, the right level of success. If we turn our attention to Thailand, it's, it's interesting to consider um, how through this pandemic, Thailand, a, a long-time ally of the United States, um, has, has seen uh, that our ally turn ever more inwards in its focus. And of course, over the past decade or so, um, Thailand has increased its dependence on China in economic, political, and perhaps to an extent, even in security terms. So what that means, especially under a new king with an entrenched group, of, of now elected military leaders uh, running the show um, is going to be challenging for Australia. And then we come, of course, to, to China, where it's perhaps perceptions of pandemic performance um, that need to be put front and centre right now. And as we all appreciate um, reading the Australian and the international media day in and day out, we find that there is a huge amount of variation in the reception of China's performance and that it is uh, incredibly politicised. Uh, and that's going to be a fact of life now for the years to come. So. What does that mean? I think it means wild cards for Australia's engagement with China. Uh, and it would be a very brave analyst um, who was too confident in their predictions about how that's going to go, particularly given um, the the looming presidential election in the United States uh, later this year, but then all of all of the other shifts, big and small, that are likely to unfold in the first few years of this new decade. So then to conclude, with that analytical terrain in mind, with some of the big questions ringing in our ears, and then with at least some starting points on the models for considering how it is that we engage analytically such that we can work positively and productively with Asian partners. What are going to be the implications? The implications in particular for Tasmania. So let me just put a few ideas out here before I conclude. I think the first is that Australia's success and as a subset of that success, um, Tasmania's uh, relative success when it comes uh, to managing this phase of the pandemic um, has uh, allowed for a, a fortress type mentality. And this of course in Tasmanian terms was best exemplified in this March 20 uh, Mercury front page. And I think when it first came out, some people imagined that, that it, might be, it might be a joke when, when in fact it was anything but a joke. This was a very serious response to a very grave health crisis. 
On the other side of this crisis though, as the re-engagement phase needs to begin, it's gonna be big questions about what reconnecting with the world looks like. I'd like to imagine that at some stage, the Mercury and, and others can publish similarly um, confronting, poignant, powerful, front page material that highlights the kinds of links that Tasmania will be seeking to build with the rest of the world. I think it's all fine and well under the conditions that we've faced to say that the fortress needs to be defended. Um, but once those storms have passed, it will be just as serious a job for all of us to show that Tasmania, Australia, the region, the world are seeking to to tie themselves together again with the right kind of connections, connections that are fit for purpose, connections that will lead to mutual enrichment, to trust building, to all of the things that we hope can help to sustain a, a, a reasonable, a fair, a, a democratic and an inclusive global order. Next up, of course, in a really practical sense, um, there, there is the implications uh, many and diverse around uh, the connections that keep us in business. Um, and we, we saw that at the very start of the pandemic across the Australian higher education sector, um, when the international student market uh, started to fall away. Uh, and you will all recall what that was like, uh, some of the panicked efforts that were put in place to ensure that students could come to Australia in a safe way, in a way that would protect them and that would protect the Australian community. Um, we also down here in Tasmania in particular recall those early months of the year as a time uh, when lobster um, uh, so often hastily put onto planes and flown up to North Asian markets uh, was newly available for local customers. Um, and while some of us enjoyed um, the, the lower prices um, for that wonderful Tasmanian seafood, we also appreciate that it came at an incredible cost. Um, and so the kinds of links that are going to be required in the future can't be taken for granted. They may not ever be built to such uh, a level of resilience that they can ride out this type of global disruption. And yet we have been reminded that they are fragile, they do need attention, and that where they are going to be built into new areas, um, they need to be built thoughtfully. And that's going to be a challenge and an opportunity for us all. And then I think we come to a further implication uh, that flows from all of the challenges of recent months. And, and that is the requirement on all of us to be thinking about risk in different and new ways. And if we consider again, the smart traveler map, um, a map that actively discourages Australians from going anywhere in the world, um, we can see that that's a situation that isn't going to prove uh, sustainable in the long term. Uh, we will want to be traveling backwards and forwards. Uh, diplomacy, tourism, education, so many other activities uh, require us to be able to, to move with, with some uh, flexibility and freedom um, around our own countries and then of course around the world. So how do we do that? How do we utilize um, various of our creative resources? And I'm reminded here of the, the great opinion piece uh, written by my dear University of Tasmania colleague, Ken Seng Oi, where he encouraged us. And this was right back at the start in March to be thinking ahead thinking about the kind of parties that we might want to plan um, because those parties would be good for us, good for the economy, good for society, good for the bonds that make us strong. So with this, we can, I think, take some inspiration from the past, thinking very deeply about what our country did uh, in the years straight after the Second World War, 
but then also think just as seriously about some of the innovations of more recent experience, whether that's the new Colombo plan, um, the, the, the MICTA grouping of middle powers, the investments in all sorts of different defense technologies and capabilities, also the investments that we're continuing to make when it comes to renewable energy, which in a world as interconnected as the one that has existed until 2019, um, will mean not just a battery of the nation, but potentially batteries of the region. Um, opportunities for Australia's renewable energy, as some commentators have recently told us, um, to, to lead towards an energy superpower status for Australia. That has huge strategic consequences, of course, um, but we need to be serious about what that would look like in practice. So then finally, before I conclude, let's keep an eye on the very long term. Um, I note that in the 2017 Foreign Policy White Paper, uh, the government took the time to set out an agenda around the southern continent, around Antarctica. And I think as uh, most who are listening to this lecture this evening will appreciate, uh, we have as Australia a specific responsibility. 42% uh, of the continent as the Australian Antarctic Territory. And, and as the Foreign Policy White Paper tells us, um, we want to preserve Antarctica as a region devoted to peace and science and to reduce the potential for strategic competition to Australia's south. So how are we going to do that? How does Tasmania fit into that picture? These are some of the big questions, the big opportunities, the big risks, the big possibilities of the years to come. So to conclude, I'd also like to focus some attention very briefly on the Tasmania project that some of my University of Tasmania colleagues um, have uh, instituted over the last few months, a wonderful research activity, an activity which will also over time have some international dimensions, allowing us all to better understand how Tasmania fits into the world at large. And so on that note, and with another splendid photograph of a Tasmanian landscape, um, I really am looking forward to your, to your questions, to your comments, to your criticisms, and please do also get in touch with me at my University of Tasmania address if you you'd like to continue the conversation. Uh, and for now, back to you, Kim, and time for our Q&A. Thanks, Nicholas. Um, that was a terrific presentation, a sobering presentation, as one of the Q&A uh, questioners has said. And I'll get to specifically the questions later. Just to advise people that as part or towards the end of the Q&A, the university will be putting up a small poll about um, times for these particular lectures. This one started at five and will finish at six. Um, and so the little poll will ask you, is this the right sort of time or would you prefer other times? Now, back to Nicholas. So, um, Nicholas, essentially, um, there's, a there's a range of questions and I'll try and get through them if we can, but if there's any you particularly want to answer, um, go for it. Um, the first question is from Lloyd Bromfield, and it asks about the relevance of the white paper, particularly in relation to COVID-19, but also considering the changes in Chinese behaviour. Yeah, th thanks very much, Lloyd. It's a, it's a great question. So my attitude towards historical documents, whether it's a 2017 white paper or perhaps the kinds of materials that we find in, in government archives, in dusty libraries or in the, the deep dark corners of the internet, is that they, they all help us. They help us to better appreciate the conditions that we're in. I, th I think it's fair to say that China's assertiveness and indeed um, newfound aggression in many areas of its foreign policy, in, in fact, in many areas of its domestic policy, means that we have to keep going back to our assessments, our judgments, our starting points, our principles, and in doing so, remind ourselves of where we've been and then where we might be going next. Uh, so I, I think there's a, a really um, valuable uh, uh, role that such documents play and, and their authors, at least in my experience, um, are very comfortable with the fact that they will soon be overtaken by events 
um, and with the pandemic and everything that will unfold in its wake, um, it's only natural um, that most of these sorts of documents will then need to be rewritten and rethought. And that's a process that in the Australian system, uh, we should all be paying close attention to, and we should all be seeking to, to influence in, in the directions that we feel are going to be most positive um, for Australia's long-term development and for its long-term diplomatic success. Thanks, Nicholas. The next question is from Kwan Eshun, and the question is, what do you think of Australia's front-footed call for an inquiry into the origins of COVID-19? And what do you think of Chinese, China's diplomatic response to that? Yeah, thanks very much. This has been a big one, and uh, no doubt it will be talked about uh, for some years to come. Uh, my, my view is that uh, some of the early handling um, appeared from this distance, um, uh, recognising that, that I'm here in Hobart uh, and under pandemic conditions, it can be difficult to know exactly what's going on. Um, but I, I thought that there were elements of the, the early presentation um, of this particular issue uh, that were pretty clunky uh, and that allowed for the type of Chinese response that we've subsequently seen. Um, Australia's early efforts did, though, uh, apparently, um, open up sufficient space for others to then help drive uh, what appears to be an entirely reasonable global response, so reasonable, in fact, um, that in uh, the final version, the Chinese themselves were prepared to, to endorse it. The fact that China has now targeted Australia um, in some pretty uh, firm ways uh, in recent weeks, both in Beijing, in Canberra and elsewhere, um, is a reminder that what we say and what we do um, does have some consequences. And I, 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 I think that that's in the overall scheme of things, uh, not a bad place to be. Um, and that then will mean uh, that everybody speaking in Australia, whether in a personal or an official capacity, um, needs to look carefully at the consequences um, of the sorts of positions that we take. Uh, and in my judgment, there's going to be a lot more of this in the years to come. Uh, and that means, I hope, uh, we all also get a fair bit better uh, when it comes to positioning ourselves in these big debates. Okay, um, one from um, AIIA Tasmania Vice President Terry Narramore, who asks, what do you think of the argument for Australia to decouple economically from China? Thanks, Terry. Uh, great, great to have your question. My view is, it, if it was to be done, it would need to be uh, done uh, very carefully, uh, in sequence, uh, with an appreciation of the costs that such decoupling uh, would impose on us, and also with an understanding of the um, yeah of the receptions that would follow in China, but in other places as well, if Australia determined that we were going to decouple to any significant extent. I'm not, I'm not sure that the Australian electorate would accept um, what I understand to be some of the costs of such a process of uh, of large scale or wide ranging decoupling. Um, that's not to say that it couldn't happen. Uh, it's just that it would require all of us to be part of the public debate that I would hope um, would accompany uh, such policy reform. Uh, and uh, the Chinese would then perhaps in other ways uh, seek to extract a high price um, for any Australian efforts to reshape our economy uh, in ways that no longer supported their interests. And I suppose that's the, that's the kicker here. It is that Australian exports to, to China and um, to a large extent, Australian imports from China are hugely important to, to the Chinese as well. Uh, and that has proved to be a model um, that has allowed uh, most of us most of the time to get what we want if during the coming decade or the decade to follow, that's no longer the case, um, then we, we certainly start to move into really challenging terrain. Okay, so a specific question from um, Christine Vogel about Hong Kong, 
um, what do you see are the prospects for, Hong, for democracy in Hong Kong and what's Australia's potential role in that? Yeah, and so again, this is one that is very live. It was, of course, back in that starting point category up to the end of 2019, a, a, a serious issue that did receive a great deal of Australian government and community attention. Uh, and with the developments of the past week or so, you'd have to anticipate that it's it's only going to get livelier as the street level confrontations in Hong Kong continue. Uh, the Australian uh, official statements that we've seen so far appear to me to, to be um, appropriate uh, given uh, the sorts of values that we propose to take forward in Australian foreign policy, uh, but that doesn't mean that it's easy and I'm, yeah, I'm curious, as perhaps many of you are, about where we go next. Um, what are the um, what are the ramifications if China does push um, too far too soon in, if, in in its efforts to put a stranglehold on the democratic movement in Hong Kong? Um, and with the previous uh, question in mind and the brief answer that I offered, what sorts of costs uh, are we prepared to pay if we are one of perhaps the few countries around the world that are prepared to offer um, significant and ongoing support, rhetorical or otherwise, uh, to Hong Kong's Democrats. And I think just as a, as a footnote here, if we do find ourselves uh, then on the side of, um, of the brave, usually very young democratic campaigners in, in Hong Kong, uh, what does that mean for Australia's self-perception? Um, sometimes we, we perhaps um, don't see ourselves as um, playing a moral role on the global stage. This would be a situation uh, that might test that kind of self-perception. Thank you. Um, Chris Trivett, um, and a, there's been a couple of other comments in the question and answer as well about what a terrific lecture. So thank you, Nicholas. Um, Chris says, thank you for such a, a thorough, if sobering sketch, um, pointing up the forthcoming pressures that will be brought to bear on political leadership, leadership at both federal and as well as state levels. Are these new demands really of a new order? relative to recent decades? And if so, what are the key implications on how best to step up to that new order? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, yeah, and we, we often fall into this bad habit, don't we, of imagining that our moment is somehow exceptional, unique, spectacular in ways that nobody else would have ever faced or considered. Um, uh, yeah, and yet when I look at that map of, of the world and I imagine what's going to be recovered by uh, local and national leaders to ensure that their economies uh, can continue to build the strength that, that is possible um, through global trading links, through the right kind of people-to-people -people partnerships and all the rest, I think that we are moving in directions that none of us at least have faced. Uh, we may be able to point to some uh, historical episodes uh, which had many of these characteristics um, and yet to be grappling with these kinds of challenges at a time when we can also be, as we are tonight, um, delivering uh, a lecture uh, from a small home office uh, in the suburbs of Hobart to an audience, um, I understand, not just all around Tasmania, but all around Australia and indeed in quite a few corners of the world, is a particular kind of challenge slash opportunity um, that is going to require of our leaders and of of all of us a different type of, of work and thinking. And so I'd be inclined to suggest that while I am usually very skeptical of the kind of um, self-proclaimed uh, exceptionalism of our particular time and place 
this is actually a time when every place um, is confronting this all at once in different ways. And I suppose that's where pandemic performance and the perceptions of pandemic performance are going to become such big factors for everyone over the years to come. But in any case, I'll keep thinking about the question. It's a really good one. Thank you. This, I don't think we'll make it through all the questions, so I'm just going to pick and choose a couple of others to cover a sort of broader um, area, and I'm sure that um, there'd be potential to email you later, Nicholas, if, um, if people don't get their questions answered tonight. Awesome. So, firstly, um, Brett Charlton from Australia-China Business Council asks, do you think that the Belt and Road Initiative is a security threat or a trade opportunity? Yeah, so I, I think, Brett, uh, it's probably one of the proverbial double-edged swords. Um, I, I think this is one that, that that's a conundrum for us, uh, simply because uh, the Belt and Road Initiative could have huge upside if properly handled by appropriately briefed and responsive leaders at whatever level um, in a particular country to, to make the most of, of what the Chinese might be offering. Um, and then in the very next breath, we have to consider the potential downsides that come with um, uncontrolled uh, Chinese uh, investment influence. And then, yes, I think we have to uh, say it as well, interference uh, in situations that could uh, undermine any of the benefits that we might imagine could flow from a particular Belt and Road initiative. So, uh, so therefore, what, what do we do? We, we look carefully at all the evidence. Um, we consider situations on a case-by-case -case basis. I know that in Australia, there has, in recent times, been a huge amount of concern about the Victorian government's um, efforts to run something of an independent approach to BRI um, uh, invitations. Um, what I think we might also also need to consider in Australia is that the, the federation um, of the six states and two territories provides us with a chance to experiment as well um, and where the appropriate risk mitigation mechanisms are put in place um, why not consider utilizing some of our diversity some of our geographical depth to ensure that we can best understand what BRI means uh, and what it would mean for us in different ways at different different times. Um, so with that double-edged sword uh, in hand, um, let's look really seriously at BRI. Um, let's take it as seriously as the Chinese do, um, but let's not pretend that it's always going to serve our interests. Um, and so let's, let's go about it with the right level of due diligence. Um, okay, one of the countries that hasn't been mentioned in the lecture, but um, we have a question about, which I can't quite find at the moment, but it's about India and our role with India in this process. Would you like to expand on what your, your views of our relationship with India? Yeah, thank, thanks, Kim. This is a, a really important um, uh, question and, and we could in fact I think in in the wake of the pandemic be spending a great deal more of our time uh, considering India and how it fits into Australian plans for engagement over the decades to come. Um, as I think you'd, you'd all be aware this evening uh, these relatively low level skirmishes between Chinese and Indian security authorities uh, along uh, their mountainous borderline this month have uh, been yet another uh, indication of what's at stake. Um, and with so many different unresolved issues in the, the China-India relationship, a country like Australia that seeks to work closely with both of these Asian behemoths um, just has to be paying incredibly close attention to what's going on in India. And I think that uh, the report that was produced by Peter Varghese and, and others uh, in recent times was a hugely positive contribution to the quality of Australian debate and discussion uh, on our entanglements with India. And it'd be great to see that pushed ahead uh, in 
uh, in the years that follow this pandemic. Um, we're all watching uh, with some anticipation, in fact, trepidation, uh, the way that India has locked down in these recent months, um, all hoping, of course, uh, that the human costs um, health-wise uh, are, are worth it in the sense that um, as many people as possible um, can uh, survive the pandemic in India, but that also the, the economic fallout is properly handled. And I certainly don't envy those having to make the decisions within the Indian policy apparatus about where they go next. I think it's the very definition um, of, um, of of the fiendish, wicked sorts of decisions uh, that we, we all know are out there. India, it so happens, is facing many of those right now. Thank you. I think we've got time for one more question, maybe two. We'll see how long this one takes. Um, Catherine Chalk asks, to increase cooperation and collaboration globally and regionally as we move forward out of this time, what forums do you think will be key and where will business fit in those? Mm, it's a really good question to end. So, uh, you know, the fact that we do have so many different um, uh, bilateral, minilateral uh, and multilateral forums at our disposal is, to my mind, a really good thing um, because you can never be quite sure exactly uh, what configuration is going to work best at a particular time, especially uh, during a time of, of crisis, ambiguity, uncertainty, volatility and all the rest. Um, and so the fact that Australia has been a constructive long-term contributor to the good health of so many different forums should be to our advantage. Uh, that doesn't mean it will be easy for, for the DFAT professionals and others who are tasked with making sure that Australia gets heard. But I think we, we do have something to contribute. And perhaps that list of big debates that I offered earlier in my lecture is, uh, is a bit of an indication of some of the areas where over the decade to come, Australia could be standing up, seeking to build the right sorts of coalitions and then uh, getting the work done uh, with friends from near and far. Um, business, I think, is, is going to as we have found over the past decade, um, become an increasingly important part of what it is that we do next as a country in our international relations work. Um, and just looking at some of the names here that have flashed up as I've been responding to questions, um, I can see um, some really senior Australian business figures who have committed their careers to ensuring um, that the contributions of the business community um, do uh, have the appropriate place within the, the broader diplomatic landscape. Um, and I really take my, health, my hat off to those who have made that such a priority and who've got that work done. Because now in the wake of the pandemic, that's the kind of work that puts Australia in a stronger position than we otherwise would have been. And the, I suppose the, the big question to end on here is, what, what do we all do with that? Okay, thank you, Nicholas, and thanks um, on behalf of everyone who's attended. We had um, up over 130 attendees, which was terrific, and from all states, and also from Canada, the United States, Kuala Lumpur, Hong Kong, Japan, Myanmar, and, um, and as I said, most other states. Um, basically, this is part of the University of Tasmania's um, uh, Island of Ideas project. The next AIIA um, speaker will be um, Professor James Chin talking about Malaysia 2020, um, a, pl a place in Asia of great change. And um, here are on your screen a number of other university events that will be on in the near future. Um, this event will be on YouTube, both the university's YouTube and the AIIA YouTube. Um, and um, as will all of the AIIA events um, that you can see. And if you want to subscribe to the AIIA, we'd love to have you, whichever state you're in, um, because we're running lots of terrific webinars across Australia. But Nicholas, thank you very much. That was great. Welcome to Tasmania. And hopefully those of us in Tasmania will see you in person sometime soon. Okay, thanks very much, Kim. Really appreciate everyone's time and uh, stay safe. Uh, look after yourselves. I really appreciate your attention to tonight's lecture.
thank you.